Welcome, Croiso, to tonight's Literary Salon event. I'm Elaine Canning, Head of Cultural Engagement and Development at Swansea University, and I'm absolutely delighted to introduce my colleague and our guest speaker for this evening, Dr. Laura Callas. Welcome, Laura. Tonight marks the official launch of Laura's new book, Marjorie Kemp's Spiritual Medicine, published by Boydell and Brewer. Laura is a lecturer in medieval literature at Swansea University. She's published in several academic journals and her work is also featured in The Conversation, The Independent, The Guardian and the BBC History magazine. And Marjorie Kemp's Spiritual Medicine is Laura's first book. I'm also thrilled to welcome our esteemed colleague, Professor Liz Herbert McAvoy as chair of tonight's event. Good evening, Liz. Liz is Emerita Professor of Medieval Literature at Swansea University, where she taught for 15 years before entering a retirement of sorts just a few months ago. Liz's primary research interests are in the areas of writing by, for and about medieval women, including mystical and anchoritic texts. And she also has a strong interest in critical theories of gender and sexuality and has published widely in all of these areas. Liz's third monograph due out in the spring of 2021 is on the topic of the enclosed garden and the medieval religious imaginary. So thanks again everyone for joining us this evening. Before I hand over to Laura and Liz, I'd like to remind you that you will be able to ask Laura some questions after tonight's main event and you can do so by popping your questions into the Q&A facility which you should see on your screens and if you could do, do so during the session, that would be fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Diach, Liz and Laura, over to you. Thank you very much, Elaine. Thank you. And um, thanks to everybody who's tuned in to hear Laura and I enter into conversation about her wonderful new book. In many ways, this is a discussion um, between one Marjorie Kemp aficionado and another. Um, one could say Marjorie Kemp obsessive to another. Um, <laughs> Laura, both you and I and this book seem to have been on a very long journey together. I recall you were working on it um, in its thesis form uh, several years ago, many years ago, when I met you at a symposium in, on medieval mysticism in Oxfordshire, if you, you remember that time. So Thank many you. congratulations on having brought it to fruition in this way. Um, and in many ways, um, you know, I think people should understand that this is probably the most expansive, in-depth and comprehensive study of the Book of Margie Kemp since the discovery of the manuscript um, in 1934. Um, I think for the first time it's been read via the lens of socio-cultural knowledge and cultural assimilation of medical texts and medical law, but not as discrete epistemologies, um, separate from the type of mystical and incarnational theologies for which Margie Kemp is best known, but in terms of a complete integration of all of these into the text. And you make that very clear in the book, for sure. Indeed, you insist in your book that the text and the impulse behind its construction cannot be fully comprehended without an understanding of the complete interdependence of 15th century theological theological and medical inheritances. And I thought I'd just read out a paragraph where you, you assert this in your introduction, just to contextualize it for everybody. You write, without recourse to the medical religious culture in which the book was produced and understood, we disembody Kemp in the same reductive manner as Petwell in 1521. And that of course was the reductive version of the book that was the only one available until 1934. Since the voice that resounds fervently within and beyond the pages of a book is one which emanates from a body through which experience begins. So that's from the introduction. I hope you remember writing it because often, often we completely forget <laughs> don't we, what, we've, what we've written. Um, but you argue most emphatically throughout that the experience is one of daily unmitigated pain for Marjorie Kemp, both psychological and physical. Um, and that is female coded, that's crucial to your argument, and that it lasts throughout Marjorie's adult lifetime. So I suppose we'll start by maybe talking about where your interest in the book came from, where you first came across Marjorie, why she spoke to you, and at what point did you recognize the insistent medical and medicalized discourse, which you've 
pervasively argued it is imbued with. So a two part question there um, to, to kick it all off. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you, Liz. Yeah, I, I have to say I've got wine, everyone. This is a celebration, so <laughs> just, just making that confession straight away, um, which is quite opposite given Marjorie Kemp's predilection for confession in the book. Um, yeah, so where did my interest in Marjorie Kemp come from? Well, I think it began in Canterbury, which is where I um, did my MA in 1999. Uh, where I was working with Peter Brown and Nikki Hallett in the Department for Medieval Studies. And obviously Canterbury is one of the best possible places that one could be based in, in terms of its medieval um, origin and, and the incredible cathedral there and so on. And I was fortunate enough to be able to work in the Canterbury Cathedral Archives during part of that year, which was um, very memorable. And, uh, and so it was really Nikki Hallett in this uh, initial module in, um, in my first semester of the MA that introduced me to Marjorie and Julian of Norwich. And I remember it was a very, very small module. There were two of us in the group, which was kind of intense. And so it sort of turned into a weekly conversation really between the three of us where we were just kind of interrogate these texts and think about them um, quite intimately really and um, I've always remembered it I remember particularly the my reading of Marjorie as being um, you know notable for how what, what kind of a colorful figure she was really how different she was from Julian even though she's she's trying to operate in those in that same milieu and in and in those same um, sort of spiritual operations but what I liked about her even then was the way in which she seemed to be such a real woman operating in this lay capacity trying to navigate the lay world and the religious world trying to navigate her life as a, a as a wife and a mother and to try to bridge those gaps really but also what's striking is what a lot of people find very irritating about Marjorie Kemp, which is her extremely emotive <laughs> behavior, the way that she feels things so incredibly viscerally, and some might say dramatically or performatively. And so really all of these things struck me um, as this being a very, very unique text, not least of course, because it's also considered to be the first female authored autobiography in the English language. So an incredibly important text as well from that point of view. Um, and so I think what struck me particularly about it is the voice that comes through. Um, and of course, we've got the scribal complexity. We've got that those layers of mediation in terms of the voice or the voices that we are hearing. Um, but I, I very much feel that Marjorie's voice is, is kind of foregrounded in this text it's very much her book and her story um and so it resonated me with me really from yeah, that respect I, I was gonna move on um to talk about the scribes because obviously you know the books scripted by succession succession of scribes and we've spoken about this many times they're all deemed to be male although um recently santa Bhattacharya has um delivered a, a really convincing paper that suggests that Marjorie's daughter-in-law may have had some hand in that and that's something that's worth bearing in mind I think. But your own treatment presumes upon Marjorie Kemp's authorial agency in dictating her life story to these scribes. You just mentioned that her voice shines through um, and of course not all critics absolutely agree with that. But um, you know, obviously, you you've your you have approached her from the position of her being um, an agent in the dictating of her own story. But I wonder where the issue of these medicalized hermeneutics um, comes in. You know, are you arguing that Marjorie herself would have been aware of these and were, was working them through in? Uh, how she dictated her book, or would you 
argue that they came from one or other of the scribes, or would it have been an amalgam of that? It's a really good question. Um, it's also a very difficult question to answer because I think it's probably all of those things. Um, and I think it kind of hinges on what we're beginning to understand as this sort of medieval principle of collaborative writing. But, you know, you rarely get one author in, in, in medieval authorship, in, in textual production. Um, and so I think we need to see this as a sort of situation of multiplicity, really, of kind of like a sort of a palimpsestic process where we are having these sort of medicalized hermeneutics being built on. Um, and of course, you know, you've already mentioned, you know, scholars like you at the moment are working on these sorts of textual undercurrents um, and various influences that might not necessarily be overt in these texts, but are nevertheless kind of rumbling under the surface as a kind of a subtext. Can't necessarily be pinned down. It's that sort of flotsam and jetsam that Hope Emily Allen talks about that I know you've been thinking about lately. Um, so how do we subscribe any of that to a single author or agent? I'm not sure we can. Um, but of course, you know, Monica Green has shown very comprehensively how medical knowledge and, and certainly those authoritative medical texts from the scholastic um, sections are very much male authored and are being distilled down to the sort of ground from, from that sort of university setting. And as a result of that, of course, her scribes, particularly her clerical scribes, who we know will have had medical training as well as theological training, um, will have, um, you know, absorbed those sorts of medical paradigms and, and discourses. And, and even before that, you know, the presidents before medieval medical writers, you know, back going back to their classical um, antecedents with sort of Galenic and Aristotelian um, writings, we're going back a long, long way in terms of where these ideas and these discourses um, come from. But I do think, and I guess I wouldn't have written the book in the way I wrote it if I didn't believe that Kemp had an understanding herself mm. of these medical discourses. Um, and we know, of course, that she has theological works read to her. And, you know, this is another question of Marjorie's alleged illiter illiteracy, which is another topic altogether, which I kind of take issue with a little bit, actually. There are, I think there are lots of moments in the text that indicate that she was certainly partially literate. Um, and we know that people employed scribes in the Middle Ages to write down their texts. So, like, we might employ a tradesperson now to help us with our plumbing. Um, so that was a normal, a normal thing to use those sort of technologies in the Middle Ages. I don't think that necessarily means that she didn't have that level of education or some form of illiteracy. So she's being read important works like Bridget Sweden's works, Walter Hilton's, um, you know, bits and pieces from Bonaventure. These are mentioned as, as is that interesting phrase that you've been working on a lot lately with the switch other texts mm -hmm. what are these such other texts we don't know what they were but they could have included medical um treatises and even if they didn't her scribes her clerical scribes her prescribe at least would have known about these discourses and i think it's almost certain that this would have been permeating her kind of wider cognition and we see this clearly in the book through her sort of descriptions of various events that just um, relay a kind of medical understanding that's just implicit really um, in what she's describing. The way that she talks about Christ on the cross, dying, the typical medical kind of physiological signs of death that we know about from those texts, the drying of the skin and the stretching and the discoloration and the, you know, the, the drying. Um, and the sort of tense, sort of waxy look, she's describing that in detail. 
the way that her writhings and her cryings are described as she's collapsing and turning blue and you know um there are even resonances of um sort of gynecological medical understanding there in terms of uterine suffocation where women were ex who were experiencing this condition of uterine suffocation where their, their their organs were literally being squashed and suffocated by their wandering wounds which is a brilliant idea i think um these very angry wounds were were kind of squashing their hearts and lungs and and you know in the trochula texts describe how women would collapse with this disorder and they would draw their knees up to their to their chests and they would be breathless and these sorts of images are ubiquitous in the book of Marjorie Kemp and so that's where my sort of thinking started really in in the sense that this this is kind of weird because you're seeing these images in the medical treatises but you're also seeing this being played out in this very integral way in, in Marjorie's book so I think it's all of those things, but I think Marjorie knows, even if it's knowledge that she's accumulated on the ground, she's she's a, this is part of her kind of cultural, medico-cultural understanding. And, um, and so in terms of the agents, I think there are multiple agents going on there, but I certainly think she is, is one of them in her own right. Of course, what we have to remember as well is that Marjorie talks all the time. Um, her knowledge, of course, does not have to be accrued from literary sources. Yeah. You know, she engages in conversation with everybody she meets. And as she tells us, it's largely conversation about the word of God. So, you know, she's talking about serious issues with everybody she meets. Mm. And I think we, we overlook that. And I know you're familiar with Laura Grimes' work on the health of mm. women where she talks about the conversational theology that went on clearly at the Helfter nunnery in the 13th century. Um, and I think that's a very useful uh, way of, of sort of approaching these texts, Marjorie's included, um, written by women, you know, knowledge is accrued in all sorts of ways, isn't it? So, you know, it's very likely that her medical knowledge would have been accrued in the same way as her theology um through through talking um so yeah. so i i think you know what you say about agency um and her sort of the macaronic nature of her um information and her knowledge base is is very important um and very important to push on you know what we what we know about marjorie um marjorie camp but moving moving on to you know um, other areas that, of your achievement in this book. Um, part of your original contribution, I think, is um, the process of deciphering the recipe that is scribbled on the manuscript and hasn't really been of any note to scholars before. Um, I wonder if you could just talk about why you knew that would be important and how the process you went through in order to decipher it um, and sort of weave it into your argument. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, this was one of, this was the, or one of, if not the most kind of exciting bits of my PhD work, I suppose. Um, because I'd already got the the sort of sense of this medicalized texture in, in the book, and, and that was already very, very clear. But it was kind of frustrating that the, everybody knew that there was this kind of annotated recipe at the back of the book that somebody later on, a later reader of this book, had scribbled down in the sort of late 15th, early 16th century. And we think probably in a monastic context, so it tells us something as well about where this book had traveled after it had been completed and who was reading it and where they were reading it. And, uh, and of course it was so faded um, and sort of, you know, probably just because of its scribbled nature and, and the quality of the ink, doesn't look anything like the rest of the text on, on the page. And it's, it's puzzled scholars, as you've said, for, for decades, you know, we knew that we could make out the words sugar and cinnamon, but that was about it. So 
you know, what was this recipe? And, and, and because I decided to take this kind of medicalized approach to writing the book, it just seemed too tempting to not try to progress this and see if I could be the one to finally unpack this puzzle. So um, it was a bit of a long process. First of all, I needed to persuade the British Library to let me work with the manuscript in, in the first place, because as the only extant copy of the book in the, in the world, it's classed now as a restrictive, restricted manuscript, as you know. So you could have a very, very good reason to want to work with it in person because it's fully digitized on the British Library website and uh, most people can do what they need to do from that, obviously, now with, with the technology as it is. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be granted that permission. So I was allowed to work with the manuscript for one day, one day only. And um, so then the next step was try to try to decipher the, the recipe. And, and at that point, it became incredibly clear why nobody else had managed to do it for them, because it was virtually illegible. Um, so I was allowed two lots of 10 minute stints in the in the ultraviolet room to try to sort of see if the UV light might reveal any more of the of the of the writing but it, it didn't really I could only really see what other people had made out before then so it was it was fantastic to be able to work with the the manuscript itself just as and of itself because it was just an incredible experience to just handle it and, and work with it for a day didn't really get me any further though in terms of the recipe um, so subsequent conversations then with the um, the lead archivist of the medieval um, archive at the British Library she very kindly offered to um, see if the British Library imaging scientist Christina Duffy would um, take some multi-spectral images of this particular folio for me um, which she very kindly did and so I was sent dozens of incredibly um, high resolution images which went through the entire kind of light spectra it was incredibly interesting and as a sort of novice with this it was also a little bit daunting but what was apparent was that one or two of these particular images did do what they needed to do they revealed more or less all of the handwriting and it was almost like magic really it was it was quite incredible so at that point i had to draw on the expertise of some esteemed colleagues um because i'm not the most expert paleographer and uh, and so with the help of lots of colleagues and friends word by word and bit by bit we just about managed to transcribe the whole thing um and you know, and discovered that it, it included um various other quite exotic expensive ingredients for this time this time period cinnamon sugar we already knew about but there was aniseed and there was fennel and there was um ginger comfits and so on lots of drying spicy ingredients and so it, it became apparent through my further research that this was a quite an ordinary medieval concoction um medieval digestives like a kind of modern rennies um called draggers and they were very commonly ingested after a, a rich meal and the idea was based on kind of medieval medical theory in terms of the humors of the body and you have to balance the cold and the dry and, and and the wet and the hot and so on and so it was really used to kind of put spices into what might have been sort of not terribly fresh or sort of fish based meals um, so it wasn't the most exciting recipe to discover, but it was great that there was a recipe at the end um, and something that we can, we, you know, we now know, we know what it is and we know um, possibly why it might be there, but not entirely. So in terms of its importance, you know, what, why is it actually interesting or important to know what this recipe is? Well, I suppose what it does is it kind of encapsulates really the very medico-religious culture in which this book was being read it, it sort of summarizes for us that um you cannot separate religion and medicine in the middle ages they are so utterly integral um the with the discourse of christus medicus and so on um 
one cannot separate body and soul in this context. And so the fact that this is there at the end of the book annotated as a, as a medical sort of addendum to this religious text it is a sort of a very convenient, I suppose, for me, um, little flourish at the end, which which kind of um, emphasizes the sort of um, the, the sort of monastic but also medicalized context in which these books were being circulated and read and thought about. Yeah, in many ways, you know, that that um, the recipe at the beginning, the way you deal with it, um, sort of reintroduce the very materiality of the, the single manuscript that we're left with. And as you said, it's just mm. a privilege to be there and able to work with it and handle it etc the way that that most people can't and it seems to me that this materiality is of um, great concern to you I mean you start your book with the recipe you finish up with the bones in the charnel house of, of Kings Lynn bones that could be you know parts of Marjorie Kemp's spine you know um, so you sort of root your book in a materiality which um, sort of stops it being just a sort of uh, maybe theoretical rumination. Um, and I think that's very important to the impact that the book has upon the reader. Um, and maybe we could just move on to talk about how you also treat, um, you structure the text by looking at Marjorie's life as a life lived you know, again, getting away from just theoretical um, ideas of, of her progress through her life. You, you focus on the adult life cycle. Um, and, you know, I relate to this very, very closely in your book because it's one that I used to a, a lesser extent in my own study of Marjorie Kemp and Julian of Norwich um, many years ago. Um, and I was musing on the fact that much of the Book of Marjorie Kemp spoke to me directly as a mature entrant into the academic life. Um, somebody who had spent time in school teaching, somebody who had spent some time away from the workplace, bearing children and rearing them. And I know that your trajectory has, has closely sort of resembled that. So I suppose my question is, um, would you say that Marjorie Kemp, Julian of Norwich, whom you mentioned several times in the book, and many of those other female mystics um, sort of resonate more loudly with you because they too often move into the intellectual life um, in, in middle age, certainly post 40. Um, and is this why the life cycle structure made so much sense to you? And I know that, you know, within scholarship and within academic circles, bringing your own experience to a text is a definite no-no. But, you know, on the other hand, like the wife of Bath, um, <laughs> personal perspectives can certainly challenge and disrupt entrenched conceptions and misconceptions and give you a very uh, unique view of a text or insight into a text. So I wonder where you are vis-a-vis -vis that adoption of the, the life cycle. Mm. Yeah, it's another very, very good question, and I completely agree that it was a, a huge thing, albeit probably a slightly subconscious thing to start mm. with. Mm. But then the the kind of resonances did become quite clear as I was going on, and absolutely, we've I, I've kind of followed in your footsteps a bit, like Marjorie followed in Bridget Sweden's footsteps. We've talked about this before. <laughs> many a time um but yes you know um my life did follow a similar trajectory to yours and to marjorie's you know um domesticity a different kind of job um and then finally eventually finding a kind of a voice in a different capacity in my context and in yours in an academic capacity i haven't been privilege to the revelations that Marjorie Kemp and Julian experienced, unfortunately. Um, but yes, I, I mean, th that kind of inspiration and that kind of intellectual kind of hunger did, I suppose, take a little while to develop, or, or at least um, it took a while for me to have the, the practical opportunities to be able to do something with it. Um, 
but of course, as you've said, a lot of medieval women follow this exact same trajectory. And I suppose that did have an implicit in influence in terms of how I structured the book, particularly in, in terms of this sort of life cycle focus and, and these points of transition, I suppose. Um, and it sort of made sense to me then that kind of foregrounding these sorts of experiences that have kind of possibility and meaning for these women at different life stages. Um, and, I, and I think as women, um, our lives are often more kind of venously shaped, I think, by our bodies and our families and, and those other kind of demands on us. And, and so our work in writing, I think, is sort of necessarily inflected by those experiences, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're not supposed to put it in explicitly to our work but I think it's always there in the background in terms of why you're doing the work in the first place perhaps even if, if even if those resonances are sort of um as at, at a sort of uh, subconscious level um and yes those transitions that I talk about in the life cycle in terms of you know I'm, I look at Marjorie's kind of marriage and her need to have a vow of chastity with her husband, which is such a memorable part of the book, and to sort of um, abrogate that life as a kind of a wife and a mother and to be freed to move into the life of piety that she wants, um, uh, then moving into her kind of post-reproductive life and how she sort of harnesses that reproductive capability and experience, but in a different way. And of course that leads on to the sort of surrogacy hermeneutics that um, we might be able to talk about if, we, if we've got time. Um, but absolutely, you know, this happens with so many of these medieval women, doesn't it? And, and Marjorie will have known about many of these women and, and, and used them as her kind of role models, just as we use other women as our role models. Bridget of Sweden, Christine de Pazan, Angelina of Foligno. Um, these are all sort of lives that, that Marjorie will have, have mm -hmm. known about. And, and so absolutely that will have informed what I was doing mm -hmm. without a doubt. Just moving on from there, um, you are meticulous about eliminating the threat of anachronism. Um, in spite of of what you say, your you know your personal relationship with with this text, um, but you do eliminate that threat, um, and instead you sort of focus your methodologies directly on medieval understandings of bodies pain and bodies in pain, um, largely. But there is a sense, isn't there, that you wish to create a dialogue between the now and the Middle Ages, on which you focus, and the now of um, our own lived and shared experiences of pain and bodies and bodies in pain. You use Freud on melancholia, for example, and of course you start the whole book with, um, with Sylvia Plath's poem, Edge, as, a, as an epigraph. Um, and later you invoke Carolyn Dinshaw's work um, about the, the now of the Middle Ages being implicated in the now of the now. Um, I just wonder whether or not you could just talk a little bit more about those choices and the importance to you of the work that you've done speaking to the now. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, you know, we've already talked about the way in which the sort of main thrust of the methodology is absolutely rooted in its medieval medicalized context. Mm -hmm. And I was very clear to make that my primary concern. But in the same token, um, one of the most interesting and important parts of, of the book, Marjorie's book, is this kind of a chronology, this a synchronicity, mm -hmm. where her life story is, is told as it occurs to her, you know, some 20 odd years later after her first revelations and, and experiences. Um, so that in itself not only gives a kind of an authenticity, I think, to the way that she's um, dictated and recounted these particular experiences, but it also sort of transcends or overwrites this standard linear temporality that we, we might see in a more conventional kind of text. And 
Um, and so she's already doing that. She's already bringing the past into the present. She's already returning and going backwards and forwards and, and, and interspersing events where the temporality becomes kind of subordinate to the, um, the sort of overarching spiritual kind of meaning that she's trying to express. So that notion of, you know, Caroline Dinchel's notion of this kind of asynchronous now, I think is quite important for Marjorie's book. Um, and so I kind of wanted to reflect that in my own book as well and to think about, um, you know, Marjorie Kemp's terms of reference are very much in her own kind of medico-cultural milieu. But as modern readers, what do we do with this book? What are we supposed to do with it? How do we respond to it? How do we respond to these multiple discourses? And, and why do they still resonate with us now, you know, nearly 600 years later? Um, and so I suppose, you know, that's why I brought Freud, the Freud sort of work on melancholia and mourning into the first chapter. And this is something that Amy Hollywood has written about as well, really powerfully um, in her essay, Acute Melancholia. And Freud is sort of focusing on this idea of this object of fixation, um, which is a reason for people's transition from a point of, sorry, there's a cat. <laughs> there's always a cat. Um, from, from this point, from this transition from a sort of a, a loss and a mourning through to a more um, kind of permanent melancholic state, which is kind of almost required or gratifying in some way. Um, and I just thought that resonated so much with Kemp's book um, mm. in terms of her own fixation, her persistent fixation on Christ's body throughout. You know, we know that she's one of the mystics that's really, you know, reluctant to let go of uh, the manhood of, of God. She's a bit afraid still of the Godhead. And, you know, we see this when she has her mystical marriage, don't we, in, in Rome, and, and, and she's quite happy to marry Christ and lie in bed with him and, and have that sort of domestically inflected experience. But when it comes to marriage with the Godhead, she's very afraid and she's actually silenced, which I think speaks volumes. Um, so she sort of wants to retain this Christic object and, and, and uh, you know, the, that image of Christ on the cross and the loss of her, her kind of divine beloved is so excruciating for her that, that she kind of attempts to retain this figure through this perpetual mourning and perpetual grieving and crying and wailing as we know. Um, and I, so I think all of those experiences of kind of, you know, grief and loss and melancholia, they still speak to us now as, as kind of universal human experiences. And so that's why I thought, you know, that's why I used the Freud in that first chapter, because I just felt that it brought the book to us a, a little bit more in terms of that kind of ubiquitousness, I suppose. And in terms of Plath's poem, yes, yeah, it, it was quite a kind of dark way to open the book, I suppose. Um, but I, I kind of chose it in part as a counterpoint to the Julian quotation that I, I also juxtaposed with it at the beginning. Julian's famous phrase, all shall be well. Um, and I, I suppose that I'm going, going back to the female experience again of, of kind of these different sort of contradictory states of experience you know on one hand you've got the pain and the sort of abjection of this acute melancholia that's being encapsulated in in Plath's poem which is um a terrifying poem really in terms of her own suicide and annihilation um which she's couching in terms of the, the female as being perfected or finally accomplished as if she's kind of some Greek tragedy that's that's kind of there to be fulfilled as some sort of woman narrative or woman text. And um, and I, I think that kind of idea about this kind of life of a woman where one might feel entrapped in this particular life route 
is very resonant in Marjorie Kent's book and and the ways in which that she's constantly trying to escape those confines as well. Yeah, um, maybe we could move on there, Laura, yeah. because I think that, that this is a very good moment to think about, um, you know, your, your new reading in terms of Marjorie Kemp as a surrogate. And I mm. think that term in itself sort of straddles the past and the present and creates that dialogue that we were talking about. And I think it's one of your outstanding original contributions, actually, to Marjorie Kemp's scholarship. Um, and is already altering the way we perceive um, the type of aesthetic self-harming practices laid down so cogently by Carolyn Walker Bynum in the 1980s. And I'm thinking of this surrogacy hermeneutic that um, you see as, and I quote from, from your book, as a central modus operandi for Kemp's devotional and healing practices. That is the substitutional activities that she undertakes both mystically and socially, and which are authorized in the locus of the post-reproductive maternal body. This seems to be a dazzling way to identify um, the way in which not only Marjorie Kemp's activities, but actually those culturally assigned to women, and thus if it's a female coded thing, and how um, women are culturally expected to take on still all types of, of surrogacy. Um, and in many ways to be a surrogate in one way or another is a destiny encoded as female. Yeah. So I wonder if you could just talk us through how you devise this hermeneutic um, and what you feel its further applications may be. In other words, where does this take you and your scholarship now beyond Marjorie? Mm. And maybe we can finish there before we go on to questions from people who are listening. Sure. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly the, the surrogacy hermeneutic did develop as a very central kind of um, feature of the book as it as it went on. And I and I think, you know, that it links into the life cycle structure in terms of once she sort of reneges those sort of reproductive, not capabilities, because she she does it before she's kind of menopausal and unable to reproduce it's, it's a sort of a an elected post-reproductive state really but she does this in various ways in the book as you know and it, I think it all sort of links very much into this sort of pre-Cartesian idea of the the body-soul dynamic in the middle ages and the way in which it's much more fluid uh concept at the time before we get to this whole separation of body and soul and so there's a much more holistic um, understanding of that at, it, at this time. And linking into that, of course, you know, you've got medieval physiological understandings of blood and breast milk is, is conceived as being sort of digested menstrual blood. So one in the same thing in terms of the matter, of, of bodily matter, this, this dealbation, which, which um, means that it's not too much of a stretch therefore to see for example Christ's wounds and his blood as being this source of milk or this source of nourishment for for Christians um, and so those sorts of associations and sort of medieval implicit understandings I think enable there are like a mechanism for enabling Kemp to go forwards and utilize that maternal experience and to harness it in terms of her spiritual profit in a different way so you know we see her crying when she sees male children we see her envisioning herself as handmaid to the virgin mary to swaddling the baby jesus and literally situating herself into those kind of biblical events back to dinshaw's idea of this asynchronous now she literally transports herself back to that immediate moment she's sort of in it and living it and and of course, she uses those surrogate substitutions as well in different ways with the Christ doll episode and with her nursing and caring of various individuals. Um, and by the end of the book, when she's narrating book two, which we probably haven't got time to talk about this evening in terms of its very different texture. Um, and this is where I think her voice comes through even more clearly and more authentically, um, much more sort of directly narrated um but she starts to be called mother 
by people that she meets and she starts to be trusted more. She starts to be seen much more as a, an authoritative kind of matriarch. Um, and so all those surrogate activities that she's been sort of assimilating over those, those years and during her pilgrimages and during her travels become kind of literalized almost and, and consolidated towards the end of her life when she ends up at, at Siam Abbey and, and, and sort of ministers really to the young man there in the chapel um, and is referred to as mother. Um, so yes, I mean, going forward, how will, how do I utilize, how do I utilize this in, in future work? I don't know. I, I've barely finished with Marjorie yet. I've only just finished a chapter on Marjorie and Julian um, about uh female spirituality in its sort of european context and i've got an edited volume coming out next year with my friend and colleague laura varnum with manchester university press that's going to be the new um sort of companion i suppose to the book of marjorie kemp we've got some fantastic contributors in there um but yes i do want to move on next in my next project to thinking about other european holy women i'm particularly interested in the Beguines. Um, in terms of their sort of comparable bridging of this kind of divide between the lay and the enclosed and how they're trying to navigate this kind of slightly liminal existence in terms of their religious pra practice. So um, I don't think I'll ever really be done with Marjorie Kemp, but I think I might give her a bit of a rest for a while. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we'll all look forward to watching this space, Laura. Thank you very much. I'll hand back to Elaine now, and I'm sure that she's got some questions there that have been coming in um, whilst we've been talking. So thank you very much. Thanks, Liz. Thank you both so much for a fascinating conversation. We do have several questions coming in for you. Um, we'll start with a question, which is actually for both of you, um, from Roberta Magnani. And Roberta asks, how has your work on Marjorie been informed by your commitment to feminism and how has it informed your feminist commitment? Wow. You want to start Liz? Well, I, <laughs> mine's, mine's fairly simple. I came to Marjorie as a, a died in the wool second waiver um, and Marjorie convinced me that everything that I thought was absolutely spot on. Um, she uh, actually, she, she taught me a great deal, but it wasn't just, um, it wasn't just the book of Marjorie Kemp. It was some of the wonderful scholarship that had been done by early feminist scholars, Elizabeth Robertson, for example, um, uh, Karma Lochri, uh, I mean, the, the, these these readings of this text, which I came across randomly in a secondhand bookshop um, when I was still a teacher, um, absolutely converted me to uh, feminist scholarship, um, and I've never looked back since then. So it was sort of, um, yeah, it, it was a bit of both. It was the book um, that absolutely spellbound me. Um, and then it was the, the scholarship that followed on from that, that taught me a great deal about ways of reading and ways of understanding. Um, so yeah, that's it really. Hmm. What about you, Laura? Well, I'm going to embarrass you, Liz, because, oh. you know. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you're one of the reasons I got into all of this in the first place. And, and oh. you know, your work and your book, um, and of course your work and your book, as you've just explained, being inflected by all those amazing feminist scholars um, before. And so that's, that's you know, that, that was my kind of inspiration originally. And, and I, you know, I just feel really privileged that I've been able to build in a really, really tiny way on all of that wonderful work. But, you know, in terms of the book itself and my feminist commitment, one of my biggest aims in this book was to sort of um, redress all of the, Pathologic, pathologic, too much wine. <laughs> the pathologies that we all, all often see happening in terms of Marjorie's um, book and, and the scholarship that kind of denigrates her perhaps and, and kind of reduces her down to this object of perplexing disorder, what's wrong with her. Um, and I kind of wanted to redress the balance really and to show how she's actually engaging with those very paradigms herself. 
and um, not just a passive recipient of them. So, so yeah, that's 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 me. Thank you both. Um, we've got another question for you, Laura, from Lucky Parish. So Lucky asks: In theological conversations, it's common to hear incarnational theologies expounded on, but it's rare to hear medicine or medical knowledge introduced into the conversation. What made you decide to frame your book around medical knowledge rather than simply an embodied or incarnational knowledge? And what can we learn from Marjorie's willingness to discuss bodily ailments and physical afflictions in conversation with the word of God? Okay, that's a, that's a really great question. Thank you for that. Um, I think I've probably answered that to a certain extent already in terms of the ways in which I noticed quite early on through my readings of medical treatises and especially gynecological and obstetrical treatises, but, but not just those, um, various other sort of medical encyclopedias and so on. And the way in which the descriptions of particularly women's disorders were so obviously apparent in the book of Marjorie Kemp, it, it, it just, could not be a coincidence that those sorts of images and those sorts of symptoms were being described in such a similar way to the symptoms and, and the sort of disorders that we were seeing in the medical texts. Um, and so that was really the, the reason that made me decide to move beyond just an embodied or incarnational theology, but to see that there was something a lot more specific going on, a lot more, a lot more precise. Um, and, and the second part of the question about Marjorie's willingness to discuss bodily ailments and physical afflictions, I think, is easily answered by, by this ubiquitous notion of Christus Medicus, you know, Christ the physician. This is, the, you know, one of the primary discourses of the time, it, you know, which is sort of stipulated in the, in the Fourth Lateran Council in 11, was it 12, 15, um, you have to call... Um, a physician of the soul before you're allowed to call a physician of the body and, and that is um, inscribed in canon law um, and so Christ as the healer and as, as the medic uh, becomes a very very primary um, discourse and I think it's also a very evident discourse permeating through Marjorie's book. Thank you for that and um, we've got a couple of questions from Joseph O'Neill who asks, was Marjorie suffering from bipolar disorder? And would Marjorie be a controversial, a controversial journalist today? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I can't see that question. That must have been in a different place. Um, was Marjorie <laughs> was Marjorie suffering for no? Was she suffering from bipolar disorder? I, <laughs> I just think that's the kind of scholarship that I've tried to avoid because I find it incredibly anachronistic and I don't think it's a very helpful way of thinking about the book in terms of um, a turning her what I see as authentic experience into something pathological um, Okay, she, you know, she was accused of madness, of course, in the book. She was accused of heresy. She was accused of various other physical disorders. Epilepsy, she's accused of in the book. Um, scholars in more recent years have um, diagnosed her retrospectively with um, temporal lobe epilepsy, um, various forms of psychosis and so on and so forth and I you know they're interesting they're interesting ways of thinking about the book but I don't think that we could possibly be in a position to diagnose her in that kind of reductive way um, I think I, I don't see really what the use of doing that would be I think it's much more useful to think about this as a, a female authored narrative of personal experience and the ways in which that experience is presented to us as readers so I, I don't think I've fully answered the question I think I've sat on the fence a little bit with that one but I, I've done so deliberately. 
Oh, thank you. I think that that leads really nicely, though, into our next question. I think we've got we've got time for for two or three more. I think um, Ian asks about the impact on on Marjorie of the Latin medical tradition, and to what extent does she frame herself as a common and demotic pilgrim seeking after truth as opposed to an authoritative author writing from experience? Oh, Ian, thank you for that question. Um, Gosh, the Latin med medical tradition, I, I don't think I'm expert enough to be able to really comment on that too much. Um, the impact on her of the Latin medical tradition, well, you know, she wasn't Latinate herself. Her clerical confessors um, and priests and her prescribe would have been um, without a doubt. So going back to what Liz and I were talking about earlier in terms of this kind of the hauntings of these various texts in the background that aren't necessarily kind of um, overt or definitive. I'm sure that's that's in there, isn't it? And and those Latin medical texts are being translated into Middle English at this time anyway, and and sort of circulating around. So so that's a bit of a difficult one for me to assess because it goes back to that um, original question about collaboration and and sort of this conversational theology, if you like, or conversational medicalized theology in, in terms of that question. Um, but what ex extent does she frame herself as a common and de demotic pilgrim seeking after truth? Uh, I don't know, I think she just does both. I think she does both, she, you know, she, she wants to, she gets out there a lot. She travels a lot. She goes around the place. She goes around the locality. She goes around the country. She goes around Europe. She goes to the Holy Land. Um, she goes to Rome. She travels in a very um, kind of abject manner sometimes with incredibly dangerous journeys and travels and traveling companions who, who um, sort of cast her aside and get fed up with her. And so I think there's some, you know, some people have argued that there's a deliberate kind of um, slightly cynical uh, attempt to be sanctified or sort of a possible, you know, am I gonna be made a saint if I make myself look like I've kind of done, done all of these impressive journeys and, and pilgrimages and, and suffered so much kind of despite. Um, but she also wants to be an authoritative author writing from experience. So I, I don't think you can separate those two things, actually. I think they kind of, they overlap. Um, it's a really good question, though. Yeah, I think that that leads really nicely into a question we've received from David Britton, who asks about the effect that the actual process of writing, rather than the fascination of scholarship, had on you. Mm. Oh, thanks, David. Yeah. Um, what affected the actual process of writing? Um, Marjorie's writing, do you mean, or my writing? Um, I'm assuming you mean Marjorie's writing. Um, it's a difficult one with Marjorie's book because of the complexity of, of its production and with the, the sort of scribal intervention and the fact that this is a process of collaboration. And there's been so much really incredible work done on this that that wasn't really my primary goal or concern, although you can't begin to understand or write about Marjorie's book without recognition of that process of writing and the difficult passage that the book has in its um, in its materialization. I think one of the things I, I was quite interested in is, you know, the book is obviously divided into two books, book one, which is um, narrated 20 years after her original experiences and then book two which um, she doesn't come to dictate until she's in her early 60s so there's a, a very different sort of much more mature inflection on the sort of texture and the tone of book two so that's something specifically that I've written about lately um, as a, a sort of a section of the book that I think is is quite different and worth further study actually I don't think the detail of book two and, it, and it's it's kind of um, its textualization has been has been looked at enough. So that's something that I hope will be looked at more as well by other scholars as well going forward. We've got so many wonderful questions coming in, and I'm so sorry, everybody, that we won't be able to get through them all. Um, but I think we can we can finish. I think with one from Louise um, Laura who asks you 
do you think that you and Marjorie could have been friends? <laughs> That's a brilliant question. What a brilliant question to finish on. Um, yeah, I, I've got to say yes, haven't I? I can't spend 10 years of my life with Marjorie Kemp <laughs> and, and say I couldn't be friends with her. So um, definitely I could be friends with Marjorie. I think we could have had some really good chin wags. So, what yeah. a lovely note to end on. <laughs> Can I thank you both so much? Laura, thank you for sharing such fascinating insights into your new book. And huge thanks, Liz, for chairing so brilliantly. Um, my thanks also to Matthew Hughes, who's been looking after everything behind the scenes for us tonight. And of course, thank you to all of you for joining us. We really do appreciate you being here tonight. We'll now be taking a little break for Christmas and we'll be back on the 28th of January for our next Literary Salon event, which will be featuring alumna Carol Healy, who'll be talking about her wonderful debut novel, The Book of Gem. But for now, thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Liz, so much. Stay safe and well, everybody, and wishing you all a very happy Christmas. Good night. Take care. Bye.